from PRX. Friends beyond the binary, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, trees with leaves. I don't know what the not like. There's deciduous tree. Oh, and evergreen trees. Or trees that are not, you know, like uh, trees without leaves. Trees with leaves, trees without leaves. But I think it more means to le lose their leaves seasonally. If you're a kind of tree like me that says, I don't care what Mother Nature says, I'm keeping my leaves, man. Whole autumn or not, uh, I'll change my own seasons, thank you. If those are the kind of thoughts that go through your head, you're probably like me. And maybe you could use an odd podcast to keep you company and take your mind off stuff so you could fall asleep. Like a friend in the deep, dark night, welcome to sleep with me. The podcast that's here to put you to sleep in a very different way. Give the show a few tries if you're new. This is a holiday uh, a highlight or whatever, I think from 2016, 15 or something like that. A little bit different, but one of a listener's favorites. Uh, to carry you through this holiday season because it's not easy sleeping this time of year for a lot of us. The uh, way the show works, I keep you company while you fall asleep, or if you can't sleep, I'm here to keep you company. Show starts off with this greeting, then there's some support. That's how the podcast is free. Then there'll be a long, meandering intro to ease you into bedtime, and then a story about a Christmas tree that took a walk, uh, and a Burger King, and some other stuff. Uh, so I'm glad you're here. It's time for Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. And these sponsors are how we were able to do this for you free twice a week. Hey, everybody. Uh, if you're giving or you're getting a holiday gift this season, check out our merch store, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash store. That's sleepwithmepodcast.com slash store. You know, a couple of most popular items are the uh, sleep shorts. You could kind of get a or a sweatshirt. And then the flowy uh, racerback uh, tank tops. Uh, those are all made. You could get, there's also sleep, sleep with me sweatpants too. Uh, but those make for great pajamas. Maybe pick up a Bernie the Butterfly bag or a sleep with me enamel pin while you're at it uh but check all those out they're all at uh, sleepwithmepodcast.com slash store that's sleepwithmepodcast.com slash store uh sleepwithmepodcast.com slash store thanks everybody all right everybody it is time for the sleepy supporter zone the one part of the podcast needs you to hear it's how we were able to bring you the, the show free choice week is the listeners who supported the sponsors elevated their support by letting the sponsors know about it could not do it without the listeners who take action and support the sponsors so let me know about it you support a sponsor you check them out you try a free trial fill out the form at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash sponsors not only will i try to thank you here i'll try to send you a thank you video and some stickers so fill out that form sleepwithmepodcast.com slash sponsors because i appreciate your support keeping the show free for everybody and i want to thank jake uh, who supported relief band not even a sponsor anymore still a product i use all the time on car rides particularly just used it so thank you jake if you support a sponsor like i said fill out that form at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash sponsors so i can thank you like jake the next part of the Sleepy Support Zone is you getting the support you need right now. If you're in need of extra help but right now, even international resources, there's a list right in our show notes you could connect with. It's also about being a part of positive change, uh, not just saying Black Lives Matter, not just saying stop AAPI, not just saying support Ukraine, but taking action uh, to be a part of positive change. Learning more, there's links to resources in the show notes where you could get started and take action. And one of the actions we've been taking is building hygiene kits as a community just sign up for the uh email list that's the best way to keep up to date i'm working on a new process uh, that everybody could take a part of uh, that's really simple uh to build the hygiene kits you could do that at sleepmovepodcast.com slash midnight mission uh, one of the organizations we're supporting is the midnight mission in los angeles so sign up it's free get a uh, free access to our live shows at sleepwithmepodcast.com slash midnight mission oh mystery bart a lot of work goes into these podcasts a lot of people Help out on it. Who are they? Chris Posty Poster Song. Sounds like an earful. Wrote the theme song. Edits episodes. Too. Carl W. The Lecture. Also edits episodes. Ashley, Kenny, Scotty, Jennifer. Runner, 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 runner. Eric and the team let us down. They're on the website. I am the mystery bar. I do the lullabies, yeah. I do commissions at Jonathan Man Darkness. I'll write a song for you. Any reason at all. You can tell me the story, yeah. You see the kindness shine straight on through When the listeners form their own Facebook group Keith, Stacy, Sarah, Julie and Jennifer These are your 
Mystery Bard. I'm at Dear Scooter on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, what do you say we slow it down and get on with the show? Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. And, how, and howdy. I never say that. Howdy. And welcome. Is howdy like aloha? Does it mean... Actually, I'm not sure. Does aloha mean welcome and goodbye? Uh, ignorance exposed tonight on Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. Let me just try to reset. Hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing? Uh, I, interrupt, I interrupted my own graceful. I think I was having a pretty graceful setup there. If you're new here, I'm going to try one more time. Uh, hey, are you up all night tossing, turning, mind racing, trouble getting to sleep, trouble staying asleep? Well, welcome. And, and howdy. Thanks, brain. That won't give up on that. I think I collided with, uh, what was that Tom Hanks character in Toy Story? Not Andy. How can I not, not, uh, how can I not even think of the name of that character? And I can hear everyone shouting it, and I'm not doing this isn't a bit either. Uh, sleep with me, podcast, but just sleep. We do it with a bedtime story. All you need to do is get in bed, uh, turn out the lights and press play. You want to say Tom, but I know it's not Cowboy Tom. And you get in bed, turn on the lights, and press play. I'm going to do the rest. What I'm going to do is create a safe place. You know, a bit of, you know, I'm confused, but I'm not confused about that. This is a safe place where you can set aside whatever is keeping you awake, whether it's uh, thoughts, uh, physical sensations, uh, feelings, emotions, noises, changes in routine, life stuff. Uh, stuff from the past that's, you know, that, that's, I'm dealing, you know, that, that's, that's, uh, hardwired into or soft, you know, plasticized or whatever. Uh, whatever it is that's keeping you awake, almost remembered who it was. Pizza Planet, that's the name of the pizza place. That's what I remember. Uh, but, but whatever it is that's keeping you awake, I'm, I'm going to try to take your mind off that. I'm going to send my voice across the deep, dark night here. I'm going to use the lulling, soothing, creaky, dulcet tones, meander powers, wings of pointlessness. I'm going to try to stay calm, even when I can't remember. Cowboy Willie? That's not it either. Oh, I just had it. It's not Andy. And they could, oh boy. It's played by Tom Hanks. One of the most, probably one of the top three movie grosses, the highest grossing movies of all time. Movie if I've cried at. This is what happens. So this is kind of why this podcast works. Like a normal, like let's say the, the, like you're going from point A to point B. Like when your thoughts do that, they probably, I think they do that by chemical stuff or electric stuff, electric through chemicals, something like that. You know, my brain, I've talked about this before, but it's pretty easy if you're new here. I've got a lot of goop in my brain. I've got a goopy brain. And there's also glop in there. There's gloop and glop. Uh, there might even be, I, I always forget which one is mi- miasma, but I think there might be some miasma in there. Hopefully miasma is not any of the gross stuff. Uh, you know, I think that for my classics days isn't good. You know, it doesn't help your thoughts go from point A to point B, and that's what happens with me. Oh, I just had it again. Uh, did I say, who is this spaceman? It was played by Tim Allen. Why can I remember the character, like, uh, Emperor Zerg. I remember all the evil. I remember the food in the like uh, Infinity and Beyond. A catchphrase. I got that. I'll get there by the end of the. the was his cow? Was his? Was his horse named Trigger? I think the horse was named Trigger, but that might have been in a TV show that was made before I was born. Uh, you know, I just paused for a few seconds. You won't hear the pause. It'll be cut out. But I still I pause to try to think of it. I can picture the character. Man, this is embarrassing, but it's not embarrassing because this is meant to me. I'm not actually, I'm not really embarrassed. I'm like a little, like, like, huh. I, I think I'm part of me is like, I'm sure I should be embarrassed, or people are thinking I'm joking. I do feel a little self conscious because I really like the Pixar movies, and maybe there's something, and so I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. It's, it's the goop in my brain, it's not the quality of your work. I just can't, my part, like part of my goof just shouted Cowboy Wes. And I said, no, that's not even close. That's not close. Uh, but if you're new here, um, I just, like, here's a, here's, a, here's a good thing. I just disqualified myself from doing anything else. 
And clearly, you like uh, this is oh, usually I'm a like when I go talk about my brain, I like to say I'm not a guru because uh, I'm not. I'm not a sleep expert, and I'm not like uh, not you know I'm someone that's been afflicted by sleeplessness, overthinking, over you know bedtime, staring at the ceiling. Uh, I think even internal, I don't know, I don't think this is an actual thing, but it's like internal temperature malfunction. I had one of those last night about three, four in the morning where it it actually ends up that there's a moral to the story, but I couldn't cool, like my bed got way too hot and I said, oh man. And then I couldn't like find the right combination. And there it is, four in the morning. I'm, like, throwing blankets off, and then I can't, like, uh, whatever happened, I don't know, like, I couldn't, I said, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't locate the lone sheet, and then I was, uh, then I tried to go sheetless, but I was like, that's too cold. And, you know, sheets and blankets offer some layer of comfort, you know, so I didn't have any, I felt exposed. And then the, 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 the and, and I don't mean to, to cause any triggers here for anybody, but then like I did any other blankets, I was way too hot. Then I started being like, why the heck am I so hot? Like I saw, you know, like this was, I was baffled. And then I said, then I was like my baffling. I started, you know, you know, where I said, what's go, what, what am I thinking? Like, this is my fault that I'm so, I can't balance my temperature. And now I'm overreacting to my temperature. And then I was saying, just could you could could you just calm down? Like just it just just uh, like the heat wasn't on or anything. The heat had been on, but it was off. And I just I finally did talk myself down. I said, let's just go sheetless. You know, let's just go sheet free, and then hopefully we'll reset. And then like we'll we'll put we'll re we'll re blanket ourselves. Uh, but it was, you know, it, it luckily is a weekend, so that's like it, like that was the easy one because they still kept a. I was like, should I get out of bed? What should I do? Holy moly. And it wasn't like I was physically worried. You know, sometimes I had to obsess about that. Do I have a fever? Like I knew, like something was off. And this is where the moral of the story would come. I, I was positive. But then I was doubting myself. I said, I'm just overreacting. I'm just overreacting. I just got to go to sleep. I'm just overthinking this warmth thing. And I think that was my internal critic because I said, geez, there's just something missing here. It ended up, I like to keep my window open a crack. Window was closed. Like this morning when I went to take the dog for a walk, I said, look at that. My window's closed. No wonder I, I was like losing my mind last night because uh, the window's almost always open. I'm lucky enough to live in the Bay Area, which is like a sleeper's dream as far as like if you like your room temperature in those 60 degrees, like uh, between somewhere between 60 and 68 degrees. Uh, but now I have the windows closed. So, oh boy. And actually the whole time I was doing that, I was hoping, I said, please, please tell me the name of that. I was begging with my memory banks. They said, please tell me the name of that character from, and why can't you, why do you just like my memory banks? They just keep saying, Andy, 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 Andy. And I said, come on. And then now it just said Buzz Lightyear. Woody, there you go. There you go. That's the old memory, the old uh, uh, dislodged by association. So luckily, so I did manage to remember that it was Woody, uh, the uh, one of the great characters from Toy Story. And Buzz Lightyear, Mr. Potato Head, I think I'm partial to the dinosaur, but of course I'm, I'll never remember that name. Also the pig, I, I'm a fan of the pig too. But anyway, I'm glad you're here. If you're new here, well, welcome. I think that was a full dose of the podcast. I could like I could almost. Uh, oh, so I guess it w- w- those were definite. Those were live loaded uh, meanders. To- to- those were meander meanders. Because uh, I was trying to remember what Woody's name was. Then I was trying to find a metaphor for the podcast, and I was talking about how I'm not a guru. Now I'm reminding myself to slow down and not talk so fast. Uh, but, you know, because I'm not a guru, I'm not a sleep expert. I'm just someone clearly that suffers from sleep and thinking problems, anxiety, and other stuff. And, you know, temperature temperature overreaction. That's what we had last night was, uh, it, I guess there's no, talk about it. Like, I mean, I had a temperature-related uh, uh, 
overreaction. That's, I mean, and these things happen. I'm sure next time I doubt I'll be coming. Just say, wonder, I wonder if the window's open. And then they say, no, of course the window's open. It's not that. It's some strange malfunction in my ability to balance my blankets. Uh, but I, as I always say, I'm not a, like, a, I have a goop in my brain. I have a lot of goo. That's why I say I'm not a guru. I have a goo brain. I've got a lot of goo in my brain. Uh, you know, I got these creaky dulcet tones, uh, particularly creaky tonight because, uh, I think because of that, too, maybe I got dried out last night a little bit, but, uh, here, here's what I posit. I guess I did like maybe go, yeah, let's just slow it down here. Let's calm it down, Scoots. Uh, but if you're new here, one, as I was saying, I guess I would say howdy. Did Is that how I started too? And then I couldn't think of Woody's name. Uh, first off, if Woody or Andy or Buzz or anybody else is listening, sorry. I'm glad you're here, though. Hopefully I can help you fall asleep, too, because I'm sure if you're a freaking toy without an owner, you know, that's going to cause some, I don't know. I don't know what it's like being a toy. Uh, but if those movies have taught me anything, that's not that easy. Yeah. Like, well, yeah, you, you, you like, it's not easy. Definitely. Um. But let's see. So if you're new here, I wonder if you've thought about, like, during this whole thing I just went through, uh, did you think about what was keeping you up at night? Because whole, my whole job is to take your mind off of stuff uh, to distract you. So usually this is how the show works. So you, like, uh, this intro is usually its own show for about, uh, I don't know, maybe 30% of the audience likes the intros and falls asleep during the intros. So, you know, we do the credits and the thank yous at the top of the show. Then we have a long intro, which is just a mangled metaphor for what the podcast is and introduces you. It's also a little bit familiar. So they see, so people know that it's a safe place and I'm sending my voice across the deep, dark night because I've been there uh, overreacting from, from a temperature malfunction. Or I guess it was more of a like a, a emotional re- anyway, not a big deal. We could, we're not here to judge anybody, even myself, even the thousands of internal parts that are judging me right now. I'm not here to judge them, you know, because we're all just doing the best job we can, and I'll be doing the best job I can for. So so we'll do a, like a setup for our series, then we'll do a story, and then we'll do the thank yous at the end of the show. So I'll be here about an hour total. So you don't have to fall asleep right away. You could just kind of listen to me ramble, but you don't got to listen to me either. And you don't even have to like really like me. You could say like some people you could like pity me or you could even like, uh, you know, just like a a fly buzzing around. You say, well, I don't love it, but it's not buzzing near me. And I'm not below. If it's going to help you fall asleep, you can pity me. Like, please don't do, you know, well, I guess there's no way if you meet me, I'll be able to see it in your eyes. But that's fine. Like, you could picture me, like, flopping around in my bed last night like I was wide-eyed. I mean, my eyes were bugged. I mean, I was like Encyclopedia Brown without the freaking, like, looking glass or whatever saying... How the heck did I get so hot in here? And why can't, like, these are the three blankets I always use. It was like suddenly I was, like, uh, it was, I guess it was the most boring test I've ever endured. And the solution was, oh, you, your window's closed. So tonight I'm, paid, I'm, I'm anticipating some icy cold sleeping tonight. Oh, boy, I cannot wait. And if I'm too cold, then hopefully I'll realize the window's open too much or something. Uh, but again, if you're good, if you're new here, this is kind of a good-natured but odd thing. So it, it doesn't work for everybody. Give it a few tries. I hope it works for you. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. Like, because I've been there, I really wish it, it would. But you know, I'm like I'm, I'm an odd bird. I've got a goo brain. Uh, filled with goop. It took me like 18 minutes to figure out that the like, main character in those movies, you know, so, you know, I'm not working like, you know, it's clear, it's clear, you know, no doubt about it. You don't need to take me seriously. Just kick back and listen. Let me take your mind off stuff. I'm going to take a lot of turns. It'll all make sense to me, but it probably won't to you. And that's, uh, it doesn't matter anyway. I'm like, uh, 
I'm just taking you along for the ride, but you can like you're, you're, you're like you're something. You know, I don't even have a like. I wish I had a grade A metaphor for the end here. But I guess the, the, the tr truth is, I'm really glad you're here. And I not only hope I can help you fall asleep, I yearn to do so. So thank you for your time. Hey, hey everybody, this is uh, your buddy Scoots, and we got a little time for, you know, it's, it's, it's the holiday season here. Uh, actually, I mean, I'm just in, when I'm recording this, it's Christmas creep season. It's or whatever you call it, and it's not Halloween, it's not Thanksgiving, but, you know, I'm getting, I'm laying the track here. And, you know, I did some digging. I went down to the story swamp and I said, what, ha you know, uh, it's important to me. I just almost said a Halloween, but what holiday tales have not been told? You know, that's what I am always in search for. The ones that they say, well, that story doesn't make any sense. Or, no, you know, nobody that doesn't have a, like, a, the right. And they say, well, those are the holiday tales. I mean, do, do you have, it? Like, I, there's no store. And I think if I opened the store, Untold holiday tales. They'd say, well, those are untold for a reason. And I'd say, well, no more. You know, if, if you know, I live in a world where I defy those kind of rules. Uh, and this is, a, this is a treat. You know, you're in for a treat to, to sleep. You know, if you, if you sleep through this, you're in for a treat because you'll be asleep. But otherwise, uh, this is quite a story. You know, one of those ones that defies all the odds of being told. Uh, but this is a story that, that has a place close to my heart. Uh, and it's called The Christmas Tree That Took a Walk. And so it is a Chris, It is a holiday. I guess Christmas, is it a holiday? It's not a holiday tree. It is a Christmas tree, I believe. Uh, but I think Christmas trees symbolize more than just... Uh, I mean, don't they, what do they, sim I, I, I'm not sure, okay, this is a material. I don't know what a Christmas tree symbolizes. I know it's a place to put presents under. Uh, back when I used to go out, you know, and, and hit, hit it, if you know what I mean, it would be something that about four in the morning I would come and contemplate as I wavered being able to stand. I would soak in the Christmas tree Sometimes even I'd sit down and just observe it. It's pitch dark and turn the lights of the tree on. It's a place of you know it's a it's a good thing to generate nostalgia. But I'm I'm not kidding when I say okay. So it's evergreen. So so is it a Christian symbol? I guess that's what I'm. Kind of, I mean I mean I went to Catholic school, so all the nuns luckily they're, they're you know yelling at me from another dimension, so they can't get a hold of me. But. uh and once again, I'm not doing this to be funny or irritating. It is an honest question. I mean, I would assume it's evergreen, so that might have something to do with it, but we've cut it down. So that kind of defeats the purpose. You know, if a tree could I'd say, well, why the heck did you make me evergreen if you're going to... But I don't, you know, uh, I don't want to get into the, the... I don't want to speak for the trees because that's what this kind of story does. Uh, but the, like, uh, and, and this was a story that just happened to be a witness to kind of, you know, indirectly, but, you know, when I was a lad, um, you know, my, my mom, she likes Christmas tree ornaments. Hey, my, hey mom, uh, hopefully you're asleep, but I mean, in a good way. And that makes it easy for my mom to shop to when, you know, I can step outside of my own anxieties and worries and think, geez, what would my mom like for a Christmas present, a holiday present? It's normally would be a person, you know, a personalized or, you know, now that I have a daughter or somehow a Christmas tree ornament involving some of that. You know, it may be even also it'd be treated with uh, dignity and respect by my son. I think we've gotten to that point, right, Mom? Now we're, we're there. We've made it a visit. I, okay, I can hear you. Now you're in my brain. That's probably, but yeah, okay, I got it. I'll, I'll come visit soon. Uh, but so the Christmas tree, uh, like you got lights. I don't like um, I don't know. I probably shouldn't speculate on this. What the symbolism? Like are druids involved? Were, were like druids the original Christmas tree? Like isn't that where it all comes from? Or is that just my uh, thing? That my misinterpretation of the facts. Uh, but this tonight's tale takes place at Christmas just like any other. 
which is to say, like just like any other imaginary Christmas, but this one uh, it took place in, in in the city. It was so nice. Uh, you can give it a, a short nickname, the Cuse. It took place in Syracuse, New York, 315 uh, area code, just in case you need to like dial information and you know, say, uh, is this story true? And they say, I'm sorry, this is information. And you might even say, put me on the phone with, uh, you know, the the Christmas tree. I think one of my cousins had thought about opening a Christmas tree farm. I don't know if he was kidding or not, or maybe he has one. This is unrelated to that, though. But, yeah, this is the t- tale of the Christmas tree that took a walk. And, and it starts, <laughs> I guess I already tried to start it, and then I were like, uh, but, you know, I don't want to start with the, the stuff like you. Once originally this tree was growing. And just like humans, trees, especially trees at Christmas tree farms, in order to survive, you know, you need to use some cognitive dissonance. And, you know, as humans, we were pretty good. At, I mean, well, I, don't, I can't speak for anybody else. I'm great at it. Holy cow. If they're. If you could. I guess you can. There are certain careers that are based on cognitive dissonance. I guess like a, telling a sleep podcast, I guess that's the definition of cognitive dissonance and some resonance. I guess I'm trying to go for a little cognitive rest and resonance or maybe cognitive, you know, anyway, enough, enough. Uh, but just like humans, just Christmas trees and Christmas tree farms practice, uh, and a lot of it's like subconscious or subtextual or just, uh, you know, we got to adjust, you know, and sometimes we maladjust and sometimes we even do. Yeah. Well, you know, Chris, like, I guess the, like the way, just like human beings, they think a lot of our cognitive dissonance, we can learn from these trees. The trees know they're going to be cut down when they get to a certain size. And so they create like different mythologies. Now I'm not partial, like I'm not partial to all the mythologies and these are a little bit different than belief systems or religions or anything. This is just like the things that trees, as little trees, start to yearn and hope for. And I think I'm telling you all this not to explain, you know, the you know the belief system of trees. That'll be out in Gingerbread Press for the holiday season 2028, the belief system of trees. And that is a pending title because it could use some tweaking. But it's to say that when trees, when the trees, when the holiday time comes and it's time, the trees have adjusted. So they're like, it is not like in the movies uh, that have never been made about trees and how, what it's like to be going from a tree just in a Christmas tree farm or a forest. Uh, you know, now, now if you take a wild tree, that's a whole different story. But these are trees that uh, they're prepared for their fate and they've like, uh, you know, they've created a system of, uh, you know, anticipation so that when uh, time comes time to get cut down, we'll just, let's just put it out there. Uh, for the majority of trees, it is not pain, like it's not painful or traumatic. It's, it's a time for celebration. Uh, you know, like it, at least initially, because that's the only thing, the downside of cognitive dissonance is it's not a, you know, you kind of, kind of got to re-up or rejuice it. And there was this particular tree named Daryl. That was the tree. This is uh, the spoiler. That's the tree that took a walk. The Christmas tree that took a walk was named Daryl. And Daryl, like a lot of the other trees, had something going. It said, I can't wait to get to, get to Christmas, the Christmas that I get chosen, you know, and that it's a big deal. And Daryl came. Now, Daryl was on a tree farm where it wasn't cut your own. Uh, so, you know, Daryl got cut and all the other trees got put in a truck and they were chit chit chattering, chitter chattering, oh boy, truck into the big city. And it was, it was a beautiful time. Like uh, it was dusk and the snow was falling and Daryl couldn't believe Daryl's like, this is the year I finally got uh, chosen and here I go. And, uh, like, uh, I don't know what the trees told themselves. They could have known about Christmas. I don't know how that would have got back to the Christmas tree farm, though, unless they speak human languages. But, uh, you know, so maybe they thought they were going somewhere else, like Aruba or something, or wherever a tree would want to go. 
I don't know, I guess that would be hard because trees don't reproduce like you, you know, so it's not going for some place where it could practice re- reproductive acts. So it, it's not that. Um, so I don't know what would, again, I, sh- I guess I should have found out, but it would probably be boring. It'd be like, uh, you know, I think maybe love and connection. I don't know. This is just speculation. Let's just say that because it's easy for us to relate to uh, that Daryl finally said, whoa, I'm chosen. And then if I, I guess this makes sense a little bit like the old, I guess this is a little tropey, but true, you know, like a pet in a pet, pet, pet store, a pound puppy, like when a pound puppy, not the store-bought ones, but actual, like says, you're the one for me, pound puppy. Uh, Daryl was waiting and Daryl, then they, Daryl arrived in this Christmas tree lot. And this was a good one. It had candy cane colored Christmas, you know, like they took the time to paint the wood that was holding the trees up and they had music and they had lights and, uh, you know, they had the different types of trees, which I'm not familiar. You know, you got your, like, the, I guess there's two, is, there, is blue spruce one of the Christmas trees that you buy or not? I ask that every year. Uh, but all you know, Daryl couldn't believe Daryl's like, and Daryl was in like in that perfect range, like the six to seven footers or whatever. I don't know. Is that the perfect range for a tree? And Daryl had great, you know, even when Daryl was plucked, they said, "Wow, look at this! Like, uh, look at the balance of these branches on this tree." You know, Daryl's uh, thistles or whatever they're called quivered with delight. And then a family came, a family with uh, six kids. They came to the lot, uh, a father, mother, an old, oldest boy named Andy, who was a giant, you know. And the kids ran through the lot and started hiding from their parents and one another, arguing you know, and then they got to Daryl. Finally, the parents were able to find most of the children. Uh, little Sheila, they they find little Sheila they couldn't find, but she was at the, she was getting hot cocoa from somebody. But they, they, they the boys, you know, led by a little Andy, said, "Well, we need a bigger tree than this. This is this, this this tree." You know, they were at the sixth, and they said, "No, no, no." And our ceiling scanner, you know, what are you talking about? I said, "Yeah, just like we need a giant tree, giant tree." Uh, more room for presence. And then uh, the parents said, you know, no, no, this is the height of the tree. We need six to seven feet or whatever it is. I don't know. And Daryl couldn't, you know, Daryl, like, uh, and we've all had that feeling in our, somewhere on the, like, a diaphragm of our stomach where you're just, you're trembling. You're shooting with delighted, delighted anticipatory joy. Uh, that this is going to be, this is it, uh, like, uh, like uh, this is it. And then the family said that we'll take this tree right here. And the year was like 1980-something, and uh, Daryl was, you know, d- d- plucked up, and uh, I don't know what a Christmas tree c- cost back then. Let's say $40, and they gave the person 50 And then Daryl was tied to the top of a station wagon with the fake wood side. I think it's a Chevy station wagon, if I could picture it, maybe a Chevy Caprice uh, station wagon. And all the, the noise was going, but it was also school night, so they had to get home. And then the kids, led by Andy, decided to, to try to, because Sheila had gotten a hot cocoa because she had ran into her friend Vanessa and her family, and they bought her cocoa. And Andy was incredibly jealous, so then the Andy tried, tried to talk his parents into stopping at the BK or in Mickey D's to get hot cocoa. And Andy was all the way in the way back. Poor little Ted was in the middle of the front seat. Uh, I don't know who was stuck next to Andy, but I, you know, whoever, maybe little Ted was stuck next to Andy and little Kenneth, baby Kenneth was in front. Uh, but it does, doesn't matter because then Andy started saying, uh, you know, he tried to figure out a chant and then he said, you know, and Andy, started, and Andy was always a little bit, uh, so he started saying R-H-O-A and then clapping and then finally his siblings fell in with him. And then Ted said, what does R-H-O-A stand for? 
And a little Andy had seen uh, the the Christmas. I think he he was confused about all. He had never had Ovaltine. Uh, he said it stands for rights for hot Ovaltine uh, for Andy and, and all of you. R H O A. And then they said, "What's O?" And he said, "Will they have Ovaltine in a Christmas story?" I think it's like hot cocoa. So, but they just want hot cocoa, and then. You know, the poor parents of these kids, six, six kids, so the oldest being Andy. Oh. And it was a school night again, and most of these kids, it's led by Andy, you know, faked brushing their teeth. I don't know why, what, what made Andy stop brushing his teeth, uh, uh, but he did. I don't, still don't know to this day. But somehow, you know, they relented and they stopped for hot cocoa, which took forever because the hot cocoa was so hot at these restaurants, you know. Uh, but, you know, we, there was a brief moment uh, when the kids, before, actually, before the kids, this was the 80s, started throwing the BK, uh, what do you call those, ashtrays at each other, like uh, Frisbee Stars of Doom. And then little Ted did get ashes in his, you know, not cold ones, ice cold ones, you know, and then the hot cocoa got dropped and then uh, did, did, no one got any, it, it just splashed and little Kenneth's uh, powder blue with a rainbow stripe across the chest, uh, like one piece uh, snowmobile suit. Uh, it, it's, you know, the hot chocolate kind of stained that a snowmobile suit of Ken, little Kenny's. Uh, but meanwhile, while this was going on, a snowstorm had befallen Syracuse, New York. Uh, combination of lake effect and the jet stream, wind chill, but it was a sudden one. Some would say magical storm. And it settled on the city. And, and for these kids, it was really a dream come true because this was like school night one. Uh, and uh, like uh, school was immediately canceled. The only time in history it's happened. Two, they got stuck because there was a snow drift action in the Burger King. And uh, they were the only customers uh, except for a couple, you know, mall walkers that were, you know, uh, already asleep at their tables, and so uh, you know that, that, that. But that's another story. Now outside at the station wagon, old Daryl. You know, Daryl didn't know how. Like Daryl could sense that Daryl's new family wasn't there, and then Daryl felt the car start to rumble and wondered his skin. Then Daryl tried to self soothe by saying R H O A, R H O A. And Daryl thought, you know, that, uh, like, Daryl wondered if this was part of the, like, Daryl didn't know what to think. And luckily, Daryl didn't get cold, but if Daryl could, it would. And soon, Daryl's binds, the wind got so strong that Daryl started shaking. And uh, and soon, the, 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 the cheap uh, dime store twine that was holding Daryl on the roof was broken. And I think this was Onondaga Boulevard, I believe, was the road. But I'm not sure because even though I lived there, I can't even remember. But uh, Daryl was swept up in a swirling, swirling wind uh, up high. And Daryl flew by the BK, flew by Wegmans, and I think it was uh, Faze. A new place called Married to Med, I think it was uh, like a new Mediterranean restaurant they were attempting to make. Uh, out of the old Ponderosa restaurant, and then it flew by over Lorenzo's and Rice Chopper, over Burn Dairy. Daryl flew into Dar- to, to Daryl. Dar- you know, Daryl just assumed this was all part of the wonder of being a Christmas tree. Uh, but it was also exciting. And then Daryl was up in the sky seeing the lights of Syracuse. And this is beautiful stuff now. We're talking about a city, twinkling city lights with the holiday lights. And some houses, you know, this is early in the season, uh, masked by uh, snow flurries and snow blowing. And if you have the distance in the, you know, the, the fact that you're a tree, 
that you don't you don't have a nerve ending. So you say, well, this is great. I'm spinning around in the wind. And Daryl almost saw it. Daryl could hear the laughters of the kids in Burger King, but they're actually crying from sugar crashes from too much uh, uh, like uh, hot cocoa that they're finally able to drink because they put tons of that whipped cream on there. You know, the kids would sleep on the floor of that Burger King with their heads on, you know, pillowy sesame seed buns. Uh, but Daryl swept higher and higher above burned dairy, watching the yin and the yang type sign of burned dairy spin up above whatever side, like whatever side, west side, I guess, uh, up against uh, above Burnett Park. Uh, Daryl flew higher and higher and spinning and spinning. Strange, you know, strange because the jet stream was hitting the lake effect where, you know, I think it's because of the temperature of the lake and moisture and stuff. Uh, deep in the snow belt, uh, Daryl flew and then the wind stopped and Daryl started to descend. And Daryl thought to Daryl self, okay, this, this can't be right. The, the proof that even holiday trees have uh, common sense. Some, that Daryl heard the voice of the person at the lot say, Oh, what a what a span of, of whatever branches they said. And Daryl uh, inverted it, Daryl's self, and as the air, you know, the whatever drag, Daryl's descent was slowed and started to slow a helicopter-like spin. And Daryl crashed into 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 to, to the part of the Burnett Park that uh, no one had been in a long time. Back like uh, with, there's these trails of this old uh, city park with old rock walls that one time had water features that have long since dried up, or so they said. But Daryl hit one of those water features, now luckily with the uh, base of Daryl's tree. And so Daryl was uninjured. But there must have been some magic in that old rock wall and the old water feature. Because uh, Daryl actually knocked some of this this old water feature. Like they said it was broken, but it was really just malfunctioning. And the water sprayed out just for a split second, obviously, because it was so cold. And then the water started to freeze. Uh, but as they said, there must have been some magic in the, this, this water that Errol ran into. Because uh, the way the water sprayed out, it sprayed across the, the, I guess it's the shaft. It sounds so racy, but it is true. And gave Daryl two legs, and it was magical. And so Daryl, who was already sentient, which, you know, some people may have a problem with sentient trees, but I don't. I do not. I know of a few. Barky, the tree god, tree beard, like a tree. I don't even know what tree beard. Tree beard's a wise tree. An ant, some would say. And we've got Groot. So there's a history of sentient trees. Daryl was not the first nor the last. Uh, but Daryl, like, uh, was also, once this extra level of sentient came, because Daryl now had legs, Daryl realized uh, that Daryl was cold. And uh, there was an oak that Daryl saw that, that it had a den in it, and, 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 and like, a uh, that looked like like it's carved out in the thing, and Daryl went into the den, and went inside the oak, and and huddled there, for waited out the storm. And Daryl slept for a while, you know, slept there in the the heart of this oak tree. And oak tree, the strangest thing, I don't know if there was a language barrier, but they didn't communicate. But Daryl stayed there and stayed warm. And the sun rose, and Daryl slept. They think also, like, the, it was Daryl's legs adjusted, ice legs, magical ice legs, is if you want to be factual about it. And then night fell again, and then Daryl awoke, and Daryl set out, stood up, and stepped out of the tree. And said, she said, I don't even know where I am, but I know... 
Uh, I'm not supposed to be just sitting around here. I got to go find my family. And uh, they remember they were at a BK, not really not that far, but for Daryl, all Daryl knew was thousands of millions of miles. When really it was like about a uh, like five, eh, two thousand feet maybe. I don't know. I'm not good at distance. But Daryl just happened to set out in the right direction, and Daryl walked to the end of the trail and ran into a street. And then Daryl took a left. And it was, again, another cold, uh, stormy night. Not as stormy as the night before. And it was late at night, midnight, one in the morning. So cold, so cold. But Daryl was, was rested and determined to find the, the family that Daryl had lost and, you know, save their Christmas, one would say. And then Daryl, like, spotted the uh, sign from the burned dairy, and Daryl's mind started. And then Daryl saw the price chopper sign and said, wait a second. Uh, and I think there was a place called the West Side Inn or something. I don't know. The Westwood Inn, there was that one and another place. And Daryl said, I think I flew over those things. One smart tree, if you ask me, the Daryl. And Daryl put one icy foot in front of another. Now, there was this was not an easy trek, as you might think. Daryl had to make it through snow banks and snow drifts and slush. Uh, just to, 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 this is Daryl's first full day with legs. Uh, luckily, they were magic, so I think they kind of you know, had some self-balancing going on. And then Daryl had to navigate the streets. Now, the streets were more or less empty. The only people on the streets should have been driving, probably. Little Andy might have been in one of those cars. And the cars would do the things, like those of you that have seen. This is when, this was thick, thick, heavy lake effects coming down now. And the roads hadn't been plowed uh, since the day before. Uh, you know, they said, let's just wait this one out. Or maybe they had been plowed and they, I don't know. So cars were, were going slow anyway. And they had that slush and heavy snow on them, dropping chunks off. And Daryl headed towards the neon signs of grocery stores and bars and grocery stores and uh, drug stores. And then Daryl saw a sign that Daryl had wrecked a scene before, before, but it was blocking. Daryl just happened to be in this corner where Daryl didn't have a view of the Burger King because blocking the view of the Burger King was the sign for the two-screen movie theater, uh, Genesee, I think the Genesee Cinemas, maybe. And But Daryl, something Daryl's mind said, head towards that sign. In the two movies they were showing, I never even heard of. One was called 90 Day Finance, and the other one was called uh, Bud Black. And uh, I, think that, I think that was an ad for some sort of new Budweiser that they were trying out. Uh, but this might have been before Dry, but Daryl headed towards that sign. Or maybe it was a movie. Maybe that was like the Spuds McKenzie movie, but that was a different, but... uh. And as Daryl got close, Daryl, you know, the, the signs of the movie theater, the blinking lights, the spinning lights, uh, the, the, you know, the, the smell of popcorn lured Daryl towards a movie theater that wouldn't, you know, those days were numbered just like a, a Christmas tree's days were numbered, you know, uh, well, maybe not exactly like that. Uh, but Daryl headed towards the theater, trekking through the snow. And somehow the theater, some would say, uh, you know, by some sort of uh, a miracle, it stayed open uh, to show films, you know, despite the nasty weather for people that didn't have cable television. Uh, the theater had stayed open also to host, I mean, because it was in the middle of the night, obviously, to host uh everybody that had eaten all the stuff at Burger King and then the other places. And actually, the people in the movie theater were begging, especially this one particular family, but other groups would just go, well, can't you just walk to your house during the day? But this was a different time. This was the 80s when people were, uh, I, guess they, I guess they were the same as they were today. They'd be, 
there's more movie theaters. So then the movie theater said, well, we could probably recoup this cost from the city or something. You know, plus people would way preferred sleeping in a movie theater uh, to, uh, you know, the floor of Burger King. And uh, so, so the, there was families there, like uh, storm refugees, I guess you'd call it. But Daryl didn't know any of this. Daryl only knew that something was calling Daryl towards the theater. He didn't know if it was a Bud What's a Bud Black? You know, that's probably what Daryl was thinking. Uh, but right as Daryl like was about to to, to mount the steps up to the theater. Uh, Daryl heard the uh, old H ch- ch- thing, and Daryl turned to the right and saw the Burger King drive-through had been, you know, and then outside of the back of Burger King, somebody was giving Daryl the old head tilt. Hey, come on in here! And then Daryl headed over, and this uh, person was standing outside the back of this Burger King. He said, "Hey, what are you a tree?" And Daryl, you know, Daryl didn't have vocal cords, so Daryl just nodded. And I said, you want to buy some lights cheap? You want to get some lights cheap or what? And Daryl did a shrugging of Daryl's, you know, tree shoulders motion. And, you know, I guess this is possible. Like, the guy said, well, my name's Melvin Gordon. Uh, How you doing? And Daryl, I don't know how Daryl acquired some of these skills, but Daryl reached out a branch to shake Melvin Gordon's hand. And they went into the Burger King, which was now empty. And this particular Burger King had one of these signs, uh, kind of signs you see a lot of things, a red dotted sign that usually... uh, has a crawl that says, hey, this is what the lotto is. Now, at this particular moment in history, this sign was the cat's pajamas. I don't know if that's a thing, but of, of electronics, you know, that said, hey, buy a Whopper, get another Whopper, whatever, you know, get double cheese on this thing. F the McDLT, that's what it probably said. And I don't know if this was a spirit of Christmas goodness, but like that was also taking stuff from the Burger King, this Melvin person, but... Uh, they ripped the sign off of the Burger King, uh, you know, signs. Also put the Burger King crown on Daryl and the sign just shoved it in the middle of Daryl's uh, trees. And the cord was hanging and then it just touched Daryl's leg and fused with Daryl's legs. And the magic of Christmas powered up the sign. And the words that crawled across were, thank you. And then Daryl walked out of the store and uh, he started to, you know, head back towards the steps up to the movie theater. Uh, but then uh, Dar- something else has struck Daryl. Daryl's a smart tree. He said, check the parking lot, Daryl, of the Burger King. And uh, Daryl headed back to the front of the Burger King uh, we're not long before they had expanded with a sol- solarium room, which was just like, a, like a, whatever you call that, like a glad, what do you call that place where you grow plants type front on the Burger King greenhouse, I think they call that. But Daryl saw that the station wagon was not in uh, the parking lot of the Burger King. But Daryl saw the tracks, and he saw the tracks headed towards the movie theater. And so Daryl followed those tracks. But then Daryl saw the tracks again, went off and went into the streets. And Daryl wondered, should I uh, follow? the? And then Daryl said, oh, my sign. So Daryl climbed up the steps, and there was a young man uh, uh, sleeping at the popcorn thing. And Daryl uh, tried to... Like, Daryl was unable to open the door, and then finally Daryl was able to bang and wake the kid up, and then the kid saw a Christmas tree with a sign, you know, whatever you call that, a light-up a crawl sign, a LED. I think these were the original LEDs uh, back when they, you know, were cutting edge. You could, you, you could buy them at Radio Shack, though. Uh, but who knows what the poor owner of this Burger King paid for this sign, but the kid looked at Daryl. 
And then Daryl said, did, have you seen a family with a station wagon? And the kid laughed. And, and then Daryl said, a family, six kids, one oldest kid, really mean look on his face all the time, bowl cut, and elastic waistband pants, uh, suede shoes with velvet. And then the kid nodded and laughed, and he said, he pointed, they were gone. And so Daryl set off, you know, in pursuit of the family, following their tracks. You know, I'm the case, you know, track, you know, tracking it all down or maybe not like that, but it, whatever that was on the trend. So, yeah, Daryl uh, said, you know, it was step after step. And, and this was how smart Daryl was. Daryl quickly learned how to scroll things across Daryl's sign and see the sign would light up the snow and learned the pattern of the tires of the car. Radial snow tires. So Daryl took a right out into Onondaga Boulevard, a four-lane road, and took took a right out of the movie theater parking lot and followed it about 200 feet to a mobile station where the car had gone in and obviously either got gas or tra- probably not, though, probably just tried to get the, some of the slush off the car so that the car could handle Velasco, a hill, uh, it usually is pretty well plowed, and in this case, you know, underneath the uh, the snow w- was some good uh, salt, and this was it, the lake effect had uh, a density and a wetness to it that you could actually get some traction. And so, after the family had pulled out of the mobile and gone right up Velasco, uh, Daryl started his trek up the hill, one foot in front of its other. Now you might be asking what kind of, I mean, at this point, you probably already have it in your mind, but uh, what kind of feet does a Christmas tree have when they're magical Christmas tree feet? And I would say that they're a bit like chicken feet, three toes and then one toe in the back, but bigger and denser than chicken feet because it's got to support a tree. But definitely spread out, you know, like so easier for Daryl to kick, a lot like chicken feet. Makes it easy, like with even with toes, like uh, what do you call them? Claw, like almost claws. So Daryl trekked up this hill, Velasco Road. Only one car passed it. And it was some, somebody, you know, that had already seen enough strange things in their life not to stop at a tree trekking up Velasco Road. And then the wind really started to pick up again. Daryl realized that Daryl would have to pick up the pace because the the track of the car was slowly getting filled in. But Daryl got up to the first intersection and saw that the car had turned right. And he said, what is the name of that road? I don't know, Onondaga, but not Onondaga Boulevard. Maybe it's called Bellevue, but I'm not positive. I think Bellevue Ave, and Daryl took a right on Bellevue Ave, maybe. I hope that's, I don't know if that's the name of that one, but that's where Daryl turned, maybe, or maybe that was, maybe Bellevue's way up. Uh, anyway, Daryl took a, the first right and tracked, and, you know, Daryl hadn't walked a lot, so Daryl tried to pick up its pace, but this was a longer road, and, uh, I go, like, at, this, at some point, I think it intersected with Glenwood, and that's when the, the snow got so bad that the, the Daryl lost the path. And then Daryl ended up wandering through the woods. And then Daryl wandered onto a golf course. And, and this is a long part, so I won't, you know, make you endure it. But Daryl wandered for night. You know, this golf course was, you know, it's 18 holes. And then Daryl walked back and forth. And this was a hilly golf course. And Daryl started to lose hope and fell into a, sand trap and cried like a man you know at least mentally cried it curled up against the side of the sand trap to stay warm and then daryl you know the next day the sun woke daryl and daryl said come on daryl let's do this one for christmas and then daryl picked his spirits back up and headed a walk to the top of the golf course uh, to the tree line, top of the hill, and Daryl could see back down to the movie theater and the Burger King and the 
the other stores, and then Daryl just uh, took a right because he knew that it's, it's left to lay Velasco Road. And Daryl had it, and said, Daryl said, well, I'll just go until, you know, I'm going to go until I go no more. Uh, but Daryl still tracked, you know, even though the sign, and then Daryl heard the, the sounds of children. And Daryl said, Man, my ears must be deceiving me, but they weren't, because soon Daryl went up a hill, and, uh, like, uh, as it crest, as Daryl crested the hill, saw kids sliding down the 18th to hole of this golf course, a majestic, majestic hill for sledding with so many different unbelievable options, you know, because I think in golf they have like three different tees and the one tee is up high, so you, so many options for unbelievably steep hill, great sledding. There were jumps, there were kids laughing, and Daryl saw a patch of orange hair on one boy. And then he saw a boy with it. Despite his hat, he could see the bowl cut and the boy's thin, thin hair and grouchy face. And the kids running around and kids going off jumps and wiping out and arguing and a harried looking uh, father watching on. And then the father looked in and made eye contact with Daryl. And Daryl uh, sang, said, Hello. I'm your Christmas tree. And the father first fell to one knee in shock and then called the kids, kids, kids. Holy cow, look at it, it's a tree. And the tree said, hello, kids, I'm Daryl, your tree. And everyone started jumping for joy. And it was like a feigning fact. The, kid, the kids that were just roughhousing earlier were hugging each other and holding hands and jumping in a circle, giggling. And soon they were circling Daryl. The father was hugging Daryl. Uh, Daryl signed and then introduced the kids Andy, Sheila, Ted, Carl, Daniel, Kenneth. Ken, you know, Ken and Kate, and then they said, everyone, no one could believe that they had a, like a living, a tree that was once living that had, you know, uh, but Daryl also told them, you know, my, you know, this is, this is my season. And then they took Daryl in the house, and, you know, just like a lot of Christmas sacrifices, Daryl's legs, you know, were made of ice. So then th that stopped working, and then, uh, for, you know, they plugged in Daryl's sign, and for a while Daryl could communicate, but soon they decorated Daryl. And Daryl couldn't believe, like, uh, like you know, then, then the, you know, the Christmas joys went on for Daryl. You know, there was a train with scented smoke. Uh, there was small, there was even bubble lights at one point, and... Uh, and, you know, the little blinking lights and the big bulb lights and different, you know, themed Christmas ornaments and kids pretending ornaments were like, you know, throwing them and, you know, breaking them too. But Daryl couldn't believe uh, that this is what Christmas was for a tree. Now, no, to Daryl, this was the normal Christmas for a tree because nothing out of the ordinary had happened. So to Daryl, like the fact that Daryl grew legs and went for a walk and picked up a sign and had to struggle to get to this house. Uh, and the kids, they would lie under Daryl and laugh hysterically. And then Daryl was there for Christmas, you know, and I don't know if that was the year of the gerbils or not. And then Daryl was able to teach, you know, the kids. I don't know if the kids, you know, the life lesson that trees don't last forever. Oh, is Daryl, you know, Daryl's my, you know, is Daryl, you know, the circle of life took Daryl. Daryl would never forget uh, what an unexpected, uh, like, joy. It was so much different than what Daryl had anticipated, which I don't even know what that was, but it wasn't that, uh, even if it had anticipated a normal Christmas, this was, uh, this was much, 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 much different. It was, you know, the, and this was, you know, it was all because Daryl didn't give up. Daryl walked because uh, it was a tree that took a walk. So, you know, that uh, that's a pretty special story for Daryl. Uh, 
and you shouldn't tell other Christmas trees about it because you don't want to set their expectations. But Christmas trees don't quit. I'll tell you that much, ladies and gentlemen. If there's one thing I've learned, you know, Christmas trees, they get caught up in a windstorm and then, you know, magically get ice legs. They don't quit. And I'm glad Daryl didn't quit on uh, Daryl's, you know, whatever, whatever it was. Uh, so, uh, mer- mer- Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, whatever you celebrate. You know, maybe there's a lesson there. You know, maybe you don't need magical ice legs to keep going, one step at a time. Uh, you know, slowly and deliberately through this season. It's just stay calm, like Daryl. Just put one foot in front of the other. Even if you're, you feel like, you know, sometimes the holidays are giant snow banks and, you know, a tundra-like golf course of uh, feelings or whatever it is, and you want to curl up in a, a sand trap, uh, you know, you can, you did Daryl, didn't know, you know, and maybe just picture Daryl sign saying, happy holidays, Daryl loves you, and Christmas trees don't quit. Uh I mean, in this story, so good night. All right, everybody. It is time to talk about Helix Sleep. It's a mattress I get into every night, that Helix Dusk Lux that I love. Helix is a premium mattress brand that provides tailored mattresses based on your unique sleep preferences. The Helix lineup includes 14 unique mattresses, including a collection of luxury models, a mattress for big and tall sleepers, and even a mattress made just for kids. And how will you know which Helix mattress model works best for you and your body? Just take the Helix Sleep Quiz and you'll find your perfect mattress in under two minutes. And your personalized mattress is delivered straight to your door free of charge. Helix knows there's no better way to try out a new mattress than by sleeping on it in your own home. And that's why they offer a 100-night risk-free trial. Try out your new Helix mattress. See how your body adjusts, and if you decide it's not the best fit, you're welcome to return it for a full refund. And everybody's unique. Everyone sleeps differently. That's why Helix has several different mattress models to choose from, each designed for specific sleep positions and feel preferences. They have models with memory foam layers to provide optional pressure relief if you sleep on your side. Models with a more responsive foam to cradle your body for essential support in stomach and back sleeping positions. Mattress with enhanced cooling features to keep you from overheating at night. And if your spine needs some extra TLC, they got you. Every Helix mattress has a hybrid design combining individually wrapped steel coils in the base with premium foam layers on top. It's a perfect combination of comfort and support. And like I said, back when I took that Helix quiz, I got matched with the Helix Dusk. I picked the Helix Dusk Luxe. You know, I sleep on my stomach, I sleep on my side, I sleep hot. You know, but I like to have a lot of blankets on me in the winter time. And the mattress is a perfect match. It's comfortable enough when I'm on my side. It's comfortable when I'm on my stomach. I don't feel too hot. And I travel enough uh, that I know it's like I cannot wait to get home to my Helix mattress. Oh boy, do I love it. Not only is it the best mattress that I've slept on, but the setup is fast and easy. Helix mattresses are delivered out of box straight to your door for free. Plus, Helix mattresses are American-made and come with a 10- or 15-year warranty, depending on the model. And remember, you get to try it out for 100 nights risk-free. And if you don't love it, I mean, I know you will, but if you don't, they'll pick it up for you and give you a full refund. And if you don't want to take my word for it, Helix is awarded the number one mattress by GQ and Wired magazine. It's even recommended by multiple leading chiropractors and doctors of sleep medicine as a go-to solution for improving your sleep. And Helix is offering up to $200 off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash sleep. With Helix, better sleep starts now. That's helixsleep.com slash sleep. Thanks, everybody.